frozen to the bone There's darkness in your soul Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog and we are at the finish line, finally. We're gonna talk about the final four issues of the crossover from Dark Web, which had Spider-Man, Venom, and the X-Men all crossing over. And that's the books we have here today. We have Dark Web X-Men number three that we're gonna talk about by Jerry Duggan and Rod Reyes. Then we also have by Al Ewing and Brian Hitch, Venom number 16, right there, with Bedlam fighting Venom. And then we have Spider-Man, Amazing Spider-Man number 18 from the Zeb Wells run with art by Ed McGinnis once again. And then the final, final part of Dark Web, which is the Dark Web finale, I think it was known as Dawn, uh, was like another name for it. But Zeb Wells, Adam Kubert. Although I was surprised in Dark Web X-Men number three, which we're going to talk about here in a second, uh, I still overall hated this run because of how it ends. Now, in the middle, when I was critical, I'm like, all right, I'm still willing to give it some credit if it somehow pulls out of this rut that it's in and sticks the landing somehow and does something just, you know, unbelievably cool with all these characters. And they do not do that. Uh, it, <laughs> they don't do that with any character. I don't think anyone at the end of this I give two craps about. And that's uh, saying something because a lot of my favorite characters, in fact, almost all of them are in this book. And I don't, I don't care. Uh, so yeah, here we go. Dark Web number three with X-Men. Uh, this is, like I said, by Jerry Duggan and Rod Reyes. This starts off, you have Forge and Sink and some of the X-Men going out there using Forge's plant thing that he created, his gun that shoots like plant life on these demons to like calm them down and, and kind of restrain them. So he's out there doing that. He's teaming up with Sink and everything. And down in Limbo, you have Madeline Pryor trying to use the Cerebro device um, to, you know, on Jean Grey to extract her memories. And so we find out fully, and I think they shit said it in another book, but I don't know if I discussed it here, fully what Madeline Pryor really wants. What she wanted was uh, the memories that Jean Grey has of her son, uh, Cable, Nathan Summers. So if you don't know the backstory, they give it to you in this issue. They tell you who Madeline Pryor is, where, you know, where she comes from and everything. She is a clone of Jean Grey created by Mr. Sinister, and, uh, and then what happens is Jean Grey disappeared for a while. She became Phoenix and was gone for a while after she seemingly died. And Mr. Sinister cloned Jean Grey or had some of her DNA and was able to clone her and created Madeline Pryor. And then put Madeline Pryor on the X-Men team, making her think she was the real Jean Grey. And her and Cyclops hooked up and because he thought it was also this, you know, Jean Grey that he knew. And they had a baby. And that baby becomes Nathan Summers. And Nathan Summers is almost like the Jesus of X-Men, of mutants. Uh, he's like the chosen one. You know, he, uh, he, he he's going to be the perfection of two bloodlines, the gray bloodlines and the Summers bloodline, something Mr. Sinister has been obsessed with forever. And, uh, and he, he finally got his wish and this, you know, chosen one, you know, awesome child is born. So anyway, that's kind of the story of, <laughs> you know, Madeline Pryor and, and her son, Nathan. But there was about a year where you know Jean Grey was raising Nathan and Madeline just wants those memories she just wants to have that those memories of her son because she feels like those belong to her and not Jean Grey and so that's what she wants out of this so you know she's fighting Jean Grey and half the issue is pretty much just the two of them in a big psychic battle fighting each other and Jean is trying to get through to Madeline she's like look you know we don't need to do all this fighting just let me talk to you. Let me get through to you. And, you know, and they're trying to do that thing that I always say in comics where it's like, why don't they just talk? Why can't, you know, like Jean Grey has the powers to give you those memories back. You know, so why doesn't she just do it? She almost looks like a giant asshole <laughs> for not doing it. So, uh, so I was really like not rooting for the X-Men for some of this until this issue. And in this issue, Jean Grey says, you know what? You're right, Madeline. Uh, you should have those memories. It, sh it should have been you. It is your son. And uh, and I feel like I didn't have him for very long, less than a year before he got taken away to the future. She's like, so if you want to know what happened during that time, I'll give you those memories. And Madeline's like, what? Is this like some kind of trick? And she's like, no, we're, we're the heroes here. <laughs> you know, even though we don't act like it lately uh, in X-Men comics. Uh, but in this one, she does. And Jean Grey says, I'll give you those memories if that's what you want. 
And she's like, okay, so boom, Jean Grey hands over. She doesn't, you know, just because she shares them doesn't mean she gives them up. So she's like, oh, I'll still remember these memories too, but if you want them, I can psychically project these memories into your mind. That's what I do. I'm Jean Grey. That's one of my powers. So she does. Um, although I do feel it's like it's lazy that they did this here, which is them, you know, writing out in text what the memories are instead of doing like cool bubbles here or whatever. Um, but then again, I guess you don't want to cover that gorgeous artwork, which I can understand that. But still, I'm not a fan of, they do this a lot in the current X-Men books. I'm not a big fan of it. Um, so uh, so anyway, they talk about the memories, specific memories that are put into her mind. And, uh, and now Madeline has those memories and she had a short life, to, you know, in her mind with her son before he was sent to the future. And that's all she really wanted. And it's enough to make her go, okay, like, I guess I'll stop being an a-hole now <laughs> and stop running demons across Earth. Um, thank you, Jean. And, you know, and the two of them kind of shake hands and, and hug. And she's like, you know, I, I appreciate what you did for me. And then Havoc and Cyclops come out with the puppies. <laughs> you know, they were able to escape their, uh, you know, their constraints. And they decide to team up and they say, hey, let's get magic back here. And magic's going to teleport us all back to Earth, and we need to stop Ben Riley uh, because he's on Earth with demons and he's causing all this mayhem and, and we do need to stop him. And Madeline's like, you're right. And since I caused this, this is my mess, I want to help clean it up. So the book ends on a note where I was surprised. I got to give Jerry Duggan credit and the people who worked on this. That was the most surprising part of this whole series was that they actually got through to the villains and the heroes did something non-violent to, you know, resolve an issue. And I was like, wow, I mean, I know that's not always the case and you can't always have that because comics have to be exciting and you got to have these battles. But in this instance, I was like, these, you could just do that, you know, which you did in Alan Pryor. Now go to Earth and do that to Ben Riley. And, you know, Jean Grey can hold Ben Riley's hand, hold Peter Parker's hand and have them share memories, you know, and, and Ben can get back what he wants. And I'm like, that's how they're going to end this. They're actually going to, they're actually going to do it. And maybe... You know, the demons, you know, because there's no ruler, maybe they'll just have to fight all the demons off and that'll be the big conflict at the end. Um, but no, <laughs> no, that's not what happens. And we're going to find out what happens here shortly. But at least on that moment, on that issue, I was like, I have a little bit of hope again. And that's where I, that's why I hate this run overall. Because right at the end, right before, a couple issues before the finale, I got this little glimmer of hope in this book. Not saying that this book was very well written because... I didn't, you know, I, I'm kind of like in the middle on it, but that moment made me kind of forget some of my criticisms and go, okay, there's hope. There's hope for a, a different type of resolution to this than what we typically see. And that will make this book at least unique in that way um, if they actually go through with it, but they don't. So that brings us over to Venom number 16, where again, characters just talking could probably work it out, but they, they don't. And then Miss Marvel comes in and she's like the, the voice of reason in this. And and uh, I don't know, some of the dialogue is really cringy. I, I feel like just like Brian Hitch doesn't really know how to draw younger people. Um, I feel like also Al Ewing doesn't know how to write, you know, younger people. So everyone in here, you know, talks like adults, but they just act like immature adults. Uh, and that's pretty much what this, this book is. Because, you know, now Dylan has turned into Codex and he's using the Necro Sword and he's almost ready to kill Bedlam. And Miss Marvel shows up and says, no, that's your dad. Don't you remember we teamed up recently and I learned about some of your history. And that's obviously the Miss Marvel crossover we talked about recently where she teamed up with Moon Knight, Wolverine, and Venom. So she's bringing that up saying, hey, we, we just met recently and, and I know a little bit about your story. You don't want to kill your dad. And he's like, yeah, but we have to because he's the chain and I'm the chain breaker. You know, again, and I know me and Swordsman had this discussion in our comment section the other day. But uh, yeah, I mean, th those are the same themes uh, as Donny Cates' run. Like, there, there's no arguing that. <laughs> that you know, Donny Cates made Clintar the cage, and that's what, you know, Dylan literally uses those words in this book. And maybe they're executing them a slightly different way or approaching that theme a different way, but the theme is still the same, in, in my opinion. Um, the theme is cages and chains and chain breakers um, and, and getting out of your hamster wheel kind of thing. So Dylan's like, no, my dad is in a loop right now. He's going to become Meridius. That you know, all this bad stuff's going to happen. Me and Red Goblin have to kill him. Um, Red Goblin does maybe sound like the most uh, kid-ish, but that makes sense because he's younger than uh, Dylan. 
Um, I don't know by how much though, but uh, but anyway, in other books, Normie kind of talks like an Osborne, and in this book, he talks like a brat. So I don't know. I I, I go back and forth again. I feel like th there there's a lot of inconsistencies with how certain writers handle certain characters. Um, and again, everyone has their own take on characters, but I mean, Normie's pretty much like you know a young adult in his own way, the way he talks, because he's you know had you know Norman and Harry as his father and grandfather. So it makes sense for him to act older. Dylan is more like street smart, uh, you know, uh, comes from a broken home um, with, uh, you know, Eddie's dad, you know, hitting him, you know, apparently and having that kind of relationship. So he's mature in a different like street smart kind of way. And I feel like none of these writers are really like doing much with that kind of like or approaching him in that way. Uh, so and then Miss Marvel, she just kind of shows up as like a know it all. And that feels very typical because I feel like she's a great character. But when people don't know how to write her, they just make her like a know-it-all. And so it's like a clash of all the things I don't like, you know, and I, so that, I think that me is my criticism for Al Ewing is that I don't think he really knows how to write any of these characters and which makes me wonder why he was put on a Venom book. Um, and this whole Meridius thing is so lame and because there's, you know, inconsistencies now because Bedlam had his arm cut off and his eye cut out, Meridius shows up and is like, look, I don't like paradoxes. When you show up to my you know garden again you don't have these wounds so i'm going to heal you so that way when you come back there's no errors you know like uh, we're not in another time paradox so it's meridius like fixing time paradoxes um you know during this and it's like uh, it, everything's just so convenient and everything and, and it feels in that way very lazy and i'm not looking forward to going back to reading Venom Monthly, and after reading this and the, this crossover, I won't be. Uh, I'll just wait for the next trade to come out, and we'll talk about it then. I'm not gonna read, I'm not gonna keep reading this book monthly. It's it's terrible. Um, so anyway, so Miss Marvel and Red Goblin and Venom team up. They fight against Bedlam. There's some twist there. I don't want to get into all of it. I don't want to spoil too much stuff, but uh, we'll get into it more in our discussion video later when I have a guest on, and we'll talk about this whole crossover. But eventually, Dylan does, you know, lose the codex uh, persona and become venom again and the three of them try to take down venom uh or bedlam now eddie brock is bedlam and his memories have been all scrambled but then the goblin queen now back on earth after the events of x-men dark web number three she's like i need to fix my mistakes and one of them is eddie brock so she takes eddie and says you're coming with us we're going to fight you know chasm so you know dylan is kind of robbed of his ability to choose whether you know he's going to kill his father or not. Check it out for yourself if you'd like, but I I, I don't recommend it at all. Um, and that brings us now to Dark Web Amazing Spider-Man number 18, where Peter is, you know, Madeline Pryor has come back to Earth, and Peter is hanging out with Rhett Rat or whatever his name is, Parker, Parker Backwards, his bizarro Spider-Man symbiote creature demon thing. Um, there is a line Peter says in here, though. They're like, who is that? And he goes, oh, uh, that's Rick Rap. And they're like, okay. And he goes, he's a demon that I had a good influence on. I don't. He's like, I don't want to get into it. <laughs> that line right there made me laugh. I was like, okay, that's a pretty good line. But here you have Madeline show right up. She goes, right to, I'm like, wait, didn't she go get Venom? So, so then now she just pops up right where Chasm is and All Hallows' Eve. And she shows up and says, look, Ben, we're done. Like, I have the scythe. I control Limbo. And I got my memories that I wanted and we're done. Nowhere does she say, hey, maybe Jean can do the same thing for you. Because Ben's like, wait, so you get what you want, but I don't get what I want. And that's it. The war is over. And he's like, I want to keep fighting. And she's like, uh, no, you're not going to keep fighting because I rule limbo. And I have as long as I hold this scythe. And, uh, and it, you know, and I get Ben's point. He's right. Like she got what she wanted and now the battle's over. But again, she should have said, but here's how... You know, here's how I got my memories back. Maybe Gene can do the same thing for you. They should at least try. <laughs> like, it's so ridiculous. You know, and, and you could say, hey, maybe Ben's too gone at this point, but still offer it to the character and then have Ben shoot it down. Even though I still won't like that either, at least at least have someone, you know, just say something, you know, of, of importance, of, of real importance. Um, so Madeline is just kind of like, she does act like that. She acts kind of shitty. She's like, I got my mine and you're not going to get yours. And, uh, instead of saying, Hey, I got mine and we can figure out a way to get yours without this destruction. Um, she doesn't say that. And it's, it's so freaking annoying. Um, so Ben kind of leaves and all Hallows Eve makes a mental note of the scythe being, you know, the, the, the thing that can make you have power to rule over the demon horde. 
So, uh, so she's kind of like taking note of that. Uh, and then meanwhile, you know, Spider-Man and Rec Rap and everyone, Jonah and all of them, Robbie, they're still in the alleyway with, uh, with the Insidious Six. And Rec Rap is using all of the spider powers and they're way different than how Spider-Man uses his. So there's a little bit of humor there, which I thought was funny, but I still, I'm not a big fan of this character. Um, and I'm not a big fan of where this story goes next, which is Al Hallow's Eve putting on her Frankenstein mask, turning into a Frankenstein, and taking the scythe from Madeline Pryor, which I'm like, wasn't Madeline with the X-Men? And she had Venom. So like, unless that happens like after this, maybe that's what this is. Maybe, maybe she goes and gets Venom after her scythe is taken. Um, but then I think she had the scythe in this book in, in Venom. So let me go look real quick. Uh, so no, actually she doesn't have the scythe. So you know what? My mistake. This book takes place, Venom, takes place after Spider-Man. So I did read them a little bit out of order. So uh, so before she goes and gets Venom, but she still had the X-Men with her. So my point still stands. She was with the X-Men um, even on the first page of this book. She's on it. So if you're just talking about the continuity of this one book, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> uh, so how was the, the scythe taken from her? Why would she go alone? I don't know. Um, it doesn't make sense. So anyway, All Hallows Eve, she takes the scythe and gives it to Ben and he becomes... King Chasm. Oh my god, he's so awesome. Not really. Uh, they give him demon wings. It's like, oh man. Um, so anyway, so that happens, and then Spider-Man and Wreck Rap decide to take the battle to the Insidious Six and Chasm and Al Hallow's Eve, and they end up failing miserably. They don't end up uh, beating him because Ben is just way too powerful now, and he raises a tower through the realms from Limbo into Earth and beyond, and is like, no, we're going to just screw everything up. If I can't have what I want, we're just going to screw it all up. And that's when Madeline says, all right, let's team up. <laughs> and Spider-Man's like, with you? And he, she's like, yes, all of us together with the X-Men and everything. And she's like, and that's, I think, when she says, I need to go get someone else to help us. And I think that's when she goes and gets Venom. So that's all leads to this, this very terrible conclusion. So, uh, so anyway, the, the finale is here. New York is, you know, completely run down now. Uh, Forge and Sink and X-Men have, with magic, have teleported humans to safety to New Jersey to get them away from the big battle. And, uh, and then now just, you know, all of New York is just taken over by demons. And King Chasm is with Al Hallow's Eve. And they're like committed, like, all right, we're going to just, we're going to go full force and it might kill us. Because the, you know, the heroes are all teaming up. It's the X-Men. It's, you know, everyone. Uh, no Avengers, but, you know, but Ben knows that the odds are probably against him. And Al Hallow's Eve knows that. And she's like, that's okay, Ben. I'm with you till the end. So I appreciate their commitment to each other, <laughs> for sure. Uh, but, um, but I didn't feel anything for them. I was like, dude, I'm supposed to really love Ben. And I like that he got Janine back and beyond. And I was hoping they would do something with her. But they didn't. They 90s her. They, they made her like Mary Jane in the 90s where she just hung out in the tower and cried waiting for Ben to come home. And then now she's, they give her, a, just give her powers. You know, it's not like she earned them or did anything. She just is given powers. And uh, I don't know, it's it's just bad writing tropes, bad current modern day writing tropes with characters where even Ben, he's just given the scythe, you know, to him. And it's like, he didn't go take it from Madeline or do anything cool. Um, so nobody has any moments in this. And that's my frustrating thing. Normally in, 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 in previous times and even some current crossovers if they're done well you sometimes it's like there's, there's a reason you want the x-men and spider-man on panels together you know like you want them to have these moments there was this moment where here where they're all gearing up to go fight ben and cyclops eyes like shimmer you know and he's like i'm ready and i'm like dude i can't wait to see cyclops just optic blast the living hell out of chasm he doesn't <laughs> he shoots like a demon it's like all everyone teams up and they just go fight the Insidious Six and these different demons. And they're not actually like, you know, really contributing to the fight against Chasm. And Peter is trying to get through to Chasm and try to talk to him, which again, I appreciate Peter trying to do that, but it doesn't last very long because then Madeline shows up with Venom and then, you know, Al Hallow's Eve puts on her werewolf mask and Wreck Rap fights Al Hallow's Eve and Magic is fighting demons and everyone just jumps into random battles and, uh, you know, just again, it's like, oh, we got to wrap all this up. We got, let's, let's bring the Insidious Six back. Let's do this. Let's do that. And, uh, 
And then finally they just go, magic, teleport the Insidious Six away. So magic just goes, okay. And after they've spent like four or five pages fighting them, I'm like, why didn't you just do that in the first place? Like, where's the strategy? Like, it's the X-Men. They fought against way bigger threats than Chasm, <laughs> you know? Uh, so it just, it's so weird to me that they didn't come up with a good strategy. I mean, especially Cyclops. It's like, again, no one had a moment in this. And it's really frustrating. And, uh, you know, we have Bedlam here who's now with Madeline and, you know, fighting for her. Um, and she's like, hey, everyone, check out my friend Eddie Brock. I erased some of his memories, so he's a little off, but he's, and he calls himself Bedlam now, but, you know, he's going to help us. And I'm just like, this is just, just the worst. <laughs> it's so bad. And everything to do with uh, Ben and everything is just terrible in this. And, you know, Gold Goblin and Miss Marvel show up. I'm like, when did they, I guess she went back to Oscorp in one of the issues. But she was just helping Venom in his issue. So, I don't know. I mean, it makes sense that they would hang out together because, you know, Norman runs Oscorp and she works there as an assistant. But, I don't know. And then you got artwork like this where, just for no reason at all, they draw panels straight down, you know, on the side. But then you got to turn the comic this way for the rest. I'm like, okay. I mean, yeah, it's a creative choice, but <laughs> it's like, I don't know. Why, why didn't... Why not lose this or put that on another page and just do a cool, you know, centerfold or something? Uh, and not that that's not cool artwork. It's just, why not take up the whole thing? Um, so anyway, that's it. It's, I mean, that's pretty much what happens. It's just an all-out fight with no real strategy until they realize they're running out of page count. And then strategy all of a sudden shows up. Um, and then Ben, in the end, is just, he's defeated. Uh, the, the scythe gets taken away. I mean, it's pretty, you could predict it, right? Um and Madeline gets the, th uh, the the scythe again. And that was the other thing, too, is she didn't have the scythe Ben did. But at, there's a point in the story where Madeline rises up and says, no, demons, you obey me. The scythe isn't what gives me power. I'm the power. And then all the demons kneel to her. And I'm like, uh, I'm pretty sure that's not how it works in Limbo. <laughs> Otherwise, Belasco, and he would just take charge again. He wouldn't need his sword, you know? So it, it's just one of those things where I'm like, they, they, when they do try to give a character a moment it makes no sense and you're just like whatever okay so anyway terrible writing uh ben gets defeated all hallows eve escapes wreck rack uh escapes so there's probably going to be stories with them later and then peter you know with ben they, you know madeline says let me punish him and the x-men are like no he's he's from our realm he should get punished here and spider-man's like i, I agree he needs to be around so I can keep an eye on him in case he ever breaks out or whatever. And she's like, no, he took over limbo or tried to and tried and did, you know, was part of this uprising. Both he and I need to go back to limbo, but I will make sure he stays punished, but not too harshly. So she puts him in like a little garden. And, and that was the thing. There's this one moment where Spider-Man's like, wait, you teamed up with this guy. You thought he was an evil genius, but his plan was just to make me eat an apple. Like, how evil genius could he really be? He's like, Ben's clearly a freaking idiot because anytime he thinks of me, he gets emotional and he can't think straight. And so his big evil plans are just garbage. And the other thing you could have said is his evil plans are garbage because he's not evil. <laughs> you know, Ben, I know Ben is going through crap, but deep down there's a Ben Riley and there's gotta be. And at the end, Peter tries to reach out to that side of Ben and, and that side of Ben is gone. Like they make it clear, like, no, he's not going to be Ben Riley again. And I'm like, this is some bullshit. This is absolute bullshit. So in the end, I hated this book. Just completely hated this book. Not just for Ben Riley, but what they did with Janine, I didn't really like the All Hallows Eve thing. I know she has a miniseries out there right now. I don't know if I'll ever read it, but apparently in it, it's her trying to get to Limbo to free Ben. So if there's some consequence, if she actually does free Ben, maybe it's something in a trade and comiXology when it goes to two ninety nine, maybe I'll buy it later and just read it out of curiosity. Um, and maybe we'll make a video if it ties into something with Ben. But to me, I can look forward to Ben Riley showing up in Across the Spider-Verse, uh, you know, the new animated film. Ben's going to be in that and he's in his like classic Ben costume and stuff. So I'm looking forward to at least getting a version of Ben I do like in something, if it's not in comics, at least in some other media. But this, not only as a Ben story, as a Peter story, this was terrible. As an X-Men story, I thought this was very terrible. The the group of X-Men they try to focus on, it didn't work for me until that third issue of Dark X-Men, number three. I was like, okay, I like this moment, at least, with, with them and Madeline. And 
doing the obvious. I'm like, I don't know why it took 15 issues for Jean Grey to just go, hey, Madeline, here's my, I mean, yeah, you could say, you could argue, oh, she was put in a childlike state and she didn't know who she was and that's why she didn't do it sooner. Yeah, okay, you could you could argue that and that's a good argument. But I don't know, th some of these stories are just uh, so forced. And I think Swordsman said that best in some of my comments where when they want, like when the editors and everyone at Marvel want something to happen, they won't look for an organic way a lot of times to do it. They will just force it. And sometimes you can force it and still tell a good story. But this, in my opinion, is one of those cases that is very clear that when you force a bunch of stuff to happen, none of it works. And that's how I feel about this story. I don't feel like on any level, even though there's a couple moments here and there that I am less critical of than other moments or that I actually liked overall as a crossover event, this did not make me want to go read X-Men after this. This does not make me want to continue to read Spider-Man. And it certainly doesn't make me want to continue to read Venom. And for me, you know, who loves all three of those characters, that's a shame. That's an absolute shame. And I'm not trying to just be a hater. Uh, I'm just, I'm giving you my opinion on how I feel this is structurally and character driven wise and art wise, which I complimented the art, some of the editing and continuity, I complimented that too. So I'm being very fair here, but I'm also being very honest. This is got to be the worst Spider-Man Venom crossover probably that I've ever read and the worst Spider-Man and X-Men crossover probably I've ever read. And I know I said this with uh, Venom Island, but like, you know, trees are dead, because, you know, so you can print comic books on them. And now luckily these had beautiful artwork, so they weren't a complete waste. But man, bring your A game. If you got Adam Kubert, you got Ed McGinnis, you got Rod Reyes. Like I think Jerry Duggan did okay with that miniseries with X-Men, but um, Jed McKay, I think, did a great job of Black Hat and Mary Jane. And we will finish that. We'll do an epilogue. To Dark Web and we'll wrap up Gold Goblin issue four and five and Black Hat and um and Mary Jane four and five. So we'll talk about that in a future episode for sure when those when that Black Cat series ends because we got one more book to come out. But you know, so I respect everyone that worked on this, but when you have these artists, Zeb Wells, you know, you gotta bring a, a much stronger A game. And the weirdest thing is is I like a lot of Zeb Wells' writing. I'm blown away by his Spider-Man run. Uh you know, I have not I liked a little bit at the beginning with the tombstone and that kind of setup and some of the character moments there. But, you know, from Gold Goblin into like Hobgoblin and some of that, like it was losing me. And then with this crossover, definitely. And I actually went out and picked up a couple other issues after this, like, uh, you know, 21 and 22 of Amazing Spider-Man as they're getting into the revealing the big secret and stuff. And I'm hating those two. Like, honestly, I, I'm, I'm really just really disappointed. I, I defended Zeb Wells with Dark Origin, Venom Dark Origin. I've defended that guy on this channel a couple times, some of the stuff he's written. And, uh, it, you know, too much to you guys disagreeing with me in the comments. But this time I am, I'm 100% on board with the people who are critical of this series. I agree. I don't like this series. It This reading this has, and that's why it took me so long to get these episodes out. It feels like going to the dentist and finding out his assistant is a proctologist and they're both operating on me from both ends at the same time. <laughs> that's how reading this, that's how discomfort that I, you know, like on that level, like I can imagine, I, you know, I know I'm using hyperbole, but I can't think of a better way to describe getting through this book. It was like, it was like getting drilled. <laughs> wow. Uh, I'm going to get removed from YouTube. Um, yeah, it just, it did <laughs> drill from both ends is what I was going to say. Um, it just feels like, uh, you know, just, getting discomfort on both ends. <laughs> That's probably the nicest way I can say that. Uh, but, but yeah, so Dark Web, I don't know. Like, did you got? do you agree with me? Do you disagree with me? The book ends with um, Madeline Pryor creating an embassy for Limbo on Earth. Who cares? I mean, seriously, who cares? Like, none of this matters. I don't care. Um, and I don't care what books, like, if, if all of a sudden artists start drawing that embassy in the background... I don't know if they're going to reference it. I don't know how many how many times we're going to see demons moving forward. Um, so I don't care. I don't care about any of this. Uh, this this book was terrible, and um, you know, and I'm I know a lot of people worked really hard on it, but that doesn't that's not going to you know I'm not going to go easier on them. I know comic books are hard to make. I know movies are hard to make. I've worked in both fields. It's it's not. You know, and, and, and obviously opinions are subjective. What I think is garbage, someone else is going to think is amazing. So I want to hear it. You know, if you if you agree with me or disagree with me, whatever it is, let me know in the comments down below. I really want to hear 
someone out there. I know someone was kind of trolling me recently about defending this book. I think it was VCXE. But uh, if you really genuinely like this book, this dark web crossover, I really want to hear from you in the comments. Uh, I might even try to interview you at some point uh, if you really genuinely like it, um, because I cannot wrap my head around the, the cluster F mess that this book was and, uh, and how I feel like it just didn't do anything to progress any characters in any interesting ways. It, it just didn't. Like Ben's back at the spot he was at the beginning of the story where he's just vengeful and hateful against Peter. He didn't change. Peter didn't change. Madeline Pryor kind of changed. And so there's something. But you could have just done your own X-Men event with that. You didn't need Spider-Man and Chasm and all that to, to tell that story. So, yeah, that could have been its own miniseries. You know, like, you know, um, the redemption of Madeline Pryor. You could have done your own book with that. And you didn't need this. Uh, especially considering Jean wasn't going to offer to Ben what she offered to Madeline, which is help him get his memories, you know, or the ones he wanted. It's just so, even if it was just like Spider-Man, you know, held, you know, Madeline's hand and then Madeline held Ben's hand and then she shared with him how Ben actually became Chasm. Because remember, he was like, I, I gave you the helmet and you kicked me into a vat of chemicals. That's not how it happened. So if she would have showed him from Peter's eyes and then maybe Ben could have been like, no, I don't, ex that can't be the truth. And then he just runs off and then you could, yeah, you could start his like third or fourth redemption arc, I guess. I don't know. Like I, you could have done anything different. Um, and who knows, maybe none of them would have, and all these are probably ideas that, that Zeb Wells and everyone thought of, and they just went with this one. This is the one they picked. And so maybe there was just no winning, no matter what they chose of all the different types of endings, that could be a possibility. But for me, like I, I think this ending for sure did not work. And I almost would have liked to seen any other option ending because I feel like it couldn't have been worse than this. You know, any other idea I feel like couldn't have been worse than this. Um, I, you could almost kill Ben again. And I think that would have been a better ending than than this ending we got. So anyway, those are again my thoughts. I'm ranting. Let me know yours down below. We'll keep talking down there. And thanks so much. I'm glad we got through this finally because I want to move on to other stuff big time. Uh, especially with Across Spider-Verse stuff. We got trailers coming out next week and other things going on. So I want to kind of shift gears. I want to get back into the Venom verse too, for sure. So, um, so I'll have some videos for you next week. Um, whenever this goes up, hopefully I'll try to get up this weekend. Um, and and we'll we'll come back and talk more Venom stuff finally and get away from this crap. Uh, but I will do a discussion video with a friend and we will talk about the entire dark web. Anything we missed, if you want to say in the comments down below, and we can make that a topic in our discussion video uh, for sure. So thank you so much. See you in the future. Peace.